Okay. So just as an overview to start with, when you think about California and fire, um, I want you to all remember just how California is a mosaic of a lot of different things. We're super diverse with our topography, our geology, our climate, our habitat types. This image is just the sort of broad habitat types and it shows you that mosaic quality and California's fire regimes are just as diverse and they're affected by all of these things. They all play a part. Um, topography as you go up in elevation you get snowpack and different elements there and different habitat types. Geology affects the soil, soil affects the plants that grow on it, climate also affects the plants and um, with our Mediterranean climate and our coastal influence, you have fog that comes in and has that cooling um, sort of moderating effect along the coast. But as you go past, as the cool weather goes past all the rangelands, it transitions into a much drier, hotter inner valley. And also as you go south, that changes as well. So just more illustrations of this diversity. Here's the parent rock types here, and then also just the types of generalized soil moisture and soil types. Thinking about fire in the landscape from a historical perspective, before any humans were on the landscape, the only way that we had fire and ignition was through lightning. And typically, lightning happens in the higher elevations because not only do you have to have lightning, but you have to have those summer storms happening when it's dry fuel. And we don't get that very often on the coast, but if you're in the Sierra Nevada mountain range, you'll get more of those summer storms coming through. And then for many, many thousands of years, 15,000 years or so, people were very closely interacting with the land and indigenous tribes used fire as a major land management tool burning certain habitat types every one to five years. And I really like this photo here because this is actually a current photo from somebody in the Yurok tribe who is, pardon my pun, rekindling this practice but in a really amazing way and just joining all kinds of different land managers together to maintain these grasslands and also woodland understories. And then just as an acknowledgement, um, I just wanna take a moment to really appreciate just how rich a history this area is as far as the native people who lived here for so many thousands of generations. This map kind of broadly shows different language types. I mean, as well as California being diverse as far as habitats and all the other things I mentioned, also equally diverse in cultures and language and tribal practices. And so, you know, unfortunately we've lost a lot of that knowledge, but I'm sure their land management practices varied dramatically with habitat to habitat and area to area. And here's just a, a photo of an amazing book that you might want to check out at some point. So types of fire, just broadly, we have ground fires, which is literally when the ground substrate is burning, roots, dry duff, moss, um, even soil if it's dry enough can burn. If this is kind of a smoldering, creeping, slow fire, but it be can become a surface fire. Surface fires, when we refer to that, it means that the low growing vegetation is what's burning. So grass or brush and understory. It's kind of a mild intensity heat normally and large trees tend to do really well with this type of fire. Then the most extreme intensity of fire is crown fire where it reaches the canopy and just everything burns. Our catastrophic fire is definitely in this category and this is kind of the hardest to recover from if it happens too frequently. And we'll get into that a bit more in a minute. Then just thinking about fire regime changes over the last few hundred years of recent history, 
basically there's a number of things that have altered the sort of natural patterns and one of the main things is fire suppression which we're probably all somewhat familiar with and then as well as that logging just because both those things tend to create dense understory and sort of a homogeneous same age a group of trees that are all fairly small in diameter growing together climate change obviously is a huge effect so co2 increase can actually contribute to vegetation increase because plants breathe in co2 um, that in addition to decreased rainfall or even just the consolidation of rain events per year so you have a shorter rainy season means that you have a much longer dry season between and then increased temperature generally means a decreased snowpack that really drastically affects the mountainous habitats that would have had that snowpack protecting them and keeping them moist for longer and then nitrogen deposition is one we don't normally think about directly affecting fire but it does relate because all this this picture of smog here that you see for LA. So as that settles out of the air, it actually becomes sort of a mild fertilizer and it most impacts the low nutrient habitats such as serpentine grasslands, which we have locally, and then deserts as well because it facilitates weedy species to come in. And then this slide always takes a minute to load. Okay, there. Did, did that top picture load, Hannah? Can you see that? Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, so then as far as more changes to our fire patterns over time, we have a lot of invasive plants that have come in to our native habitats. This top picture here, it's a really nice picture um, to demonstrate this. Basically what that does is it creates a very homogeneous, even, packed stand vegetation where fire can travel through the landscape much more easily faster. This is a picture of a skyline up around where I live and you can see a bunch of French broom has come in to an area that was cleared and now it's pretty homogeneous stand under some oaks. That also increases the chance of fire jumping from a surface fire up to the canopy. Then Plant pathogens and pests, those can sometimes be lessened with fire as far as killing them, but the main impact with increasing fire severity is these dead stands of vegetation. So you get ladder fuels and also just a lot more standing dry timber and um, stuff that can create that in and I don't know, you can probably see in this picture, those dead tree swaths, that's from sudden oak death in this case. Then the other thing that affects fire regime is just our increasing uh, wild urban interface with more homes being built in or near wild areas. So then it creates more need for power infrastructure and also just ignition sources. And it also changes how we control fire as well. So more risky fire containment efforts and also that affects the habitats. Thinking about just in a broad sense the two main categories of kind of fire type um, or intensity is wind driven. So this first category of wind driven when you think about that, what I'm talking about is extreme weather events. So we have seen this in recent history where it's just had these devastating fires. And in this case, this is the kind of fire situation where our fuel mitigation, our land management practices are not necessarily prepping us for this type of fire because this type of fire will be driven quickly across the landscape and it doesn't necessarily matter that vegetation has been cleared. Um, as you can see in this picture letter A, <laughs> that house is completely burned and the whole field was pretty much clear to begin with. Then you have down here letter E, that house also burned sadly, but the 
lawn and redwood trees are relatively intact. And in that case, they probably at least helped a little bit or they could have. Um, and then letter D, that house actually has a quite nice landscape <laughs> fire safety wise and it did not burn. So it's just these extreme wind events. My main takeaway is that it, it's not something that you're kind of prepping for. Your, your best bet in that case is just avoid ignition to begin with. Fuel driven. Okay, this type of fire where you don't have the extreme hot, dry wind conditions is the kind of fire that we're, that we're able to prepare for and can be prevented or lessened by fuel reduction or our practices. This is a really nice picture demonstrating that. So this top photo was previously um, managed with a controlled burn. And then when the fire came through later, you can see these trees will very readily, well, they didn't even hardly burn their canopies, but even the shrubs, this fire probably traveled fairly quickly, was that sort of more mild intensity and things will recover quite rapidly. Okay, so then moving on, fire and native plants. It's really, um, sometimes when you think about fire, you just kind of forget that it's so varied habitat to habitat in the responses. But fire and shrublands, okay, so probably Shrublands and chaparral, they have, they get the baddest reputation as far as our, most of our fire fears and shrublands um, are quite well adapted to infrequent but intense fires. And I know that when I started researching fire, I had this idea that chaparral did great with fire and it's just totally adapted. So why would fire ever be bad? Well, it turns out in Southern California, especially, they have some areas that are less than 10 years apart, that these slow growing shrub species have a really hard time recovering. And I'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, but that said, they are really well adapted to fire if it's in that sort of historical range of frequency of infrequent but intense. And they, these shrub blends have some really amazing adaptations to that type of fire. One of the most beautiful examples are these fire followers, we call them sometimes, the wildflowers and species that rely on either the smoke, the heat, ash, or even the light of the canopy opening up, and a combination of that and soil dormancy of lying in the soil for years makes these seeds just pop open and break seed dormancy when the fire comes through and you get gorgeous displays of flowers. And this, these are some photos of that. So one of the general patterns people have noticed, um, and this isn't necessarily the case for every shrubland, as I said, California is really diverse, but a general quality of pattern is that here's a photo of north facing, so that darker green slope versus south facing slopes in chaparral. Generally, the dominant shrub species on north facing slopes, which tend to be milder conditions, not quite as much direct sunlight, a little bit more moisture held in the soil, they tend to be the types of shrubs that recover by re-sprouting from the base. And in that case, they recover fairly quickly. Generally on the south facing slopes, which tend to be drier, harsher conditions, slower growing species, they tend to rely, and also it could be more intense fire um, as well, they tend to rely on seeds germinating and re-sprouting. And that means it's a much slower recovery because if you're relying on repopulating an area by seeds, a lot of these species take 10 or more years to reach maturity to set their own seeds again. So going back to that quality of being able to re-sprout, that's a really cool adaptation. It has a fancy word, lignotuber. <laughs> so basically this photo down here shows that bulgy base of a manzanita in this case. Manzanitas have this as well, not all manzanitas, but some species of manzanitas, some species of ceanothus also have this quality. It's where there's a lot of compressed dormant buds that are essentially waiting for the right cues to sprout. 
and those buds are dormant and compressed actually beneath the soil surface. So in this photo, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little sprout coming off to the side of that bulgy spot, which is we sometimes refer to as a burl. Um, and then this other photo shows a whole bunch of shrub, manzanita, green leaf manzanita re-sprouting in a forest understory. Okay, moving on to fire in forests. This is kind of a scary, alarming picture. This is sort of an example of probably an area that was either clear cut at one point, logged, um, or just had fire suppression over the years. So you have tightly compact undergrowth trees. How has fire frequency changed over time generally in forests? Basically fire suppression has meant that we have much fewer and farther between fires. Historically, they may have been as often as every 10 years if you're looking at higher elevations with those summer storms and lightning. Increased ladder fuels means increased intensity as well. So when the fires do come through, it doesn't stay at that moderate level where it burns out the understory and moves on. It burns and incinerates the whole thing. That said, Forests have some really amazing adaptations to fire. Two examples of this are the giant sequoia on the right and the coast redwood on the left. These two species, which are closely related, have really fire resistant bark. Um, if you've ever tried to build a campfire or have a wood stove at home, you probably know just from experience that you often throw out the bark pieces because they just don't burn as well if you're trying to get a fire going. Well, that's true for quite a number of species of trees. They also have this cool adaptation which benefits them of having their lower branches kind of shed off. So it raises that, um, it increases the level of the canopy. So it's more likely to be above flame height. Some of the understory species are really excellent at resprouting following fire. Here's a Sierra gooseberry. A lot of native tribes use fire to stimulate growth of the understory species that they rely on for, or that they use, can use for food or tools, or medicine. Some species such as hazelnut, when burned, it stimulates them to send up lots of new straight shoots, which could be used for arrow shafts, basketry, other tools. This gooseberry, within a very short time, leafed out again and is now producing lots of fruit. The other thing that happens with a fire is it can open up more room in the canopy and allow more sun for flowering and fruiting. The cool adaptation of some conifers is having cones that open immediately following that high heat. That quality, um, you can call that being a serotonous plant. <laughs> which is kind of a fun word to say. Um, but essentially, here's a photo of it. Basically, the cones are very tightly closed so that critters like squirrels won't just eat all the seeds. And then with the heat in response, it just opens right up, out comes the seeds, and they're ready to germinate with the first rains. And in the absence of fire, cones can still open, but it takes a lot longer, and there's just a lot less seeds released. In this case, this is a threatened or endangered species, the bishop pine, in this particular example. Then here's a photo of kind of more of that mild, moderate intensity fire, which is really healthy in a properly maintained understory condition. The fire travels through fairly quickly and just kind of prunes and cleans everything up. Moving on to oak woodlands, these are some of our really important um, species just for wildlife, people historically, and um, just a keystone species in general. This map is not of fires, but it's of all the different types of oak woodlands, and you can see just how important that type of habitat is in California. It covers a wide range of areas, and historically, the fire return interval, so how frequently a fire would pass through would be every eight to 16 years. Um, in some cases, oak savanna, which is slightly different, could have as often as every year 
depending on how it was being managed by native people. Most fires ideally in this habitat historically have been majority mild intensity, but with all the fire suppression for the last hundred years, you know, now if a fire came through, it'd be quite intense. Here's some historical photos of this area. Here's a picture of Redwood City over 100 years ago, and you can see just um, circle here is the oak savanna in the background, which is now all built up. And then just more demonstration of the prevalence of oaks and oak savanna habitat. Down here is an etching of a road going south to San Jose from Belmont. And then one of the cool adaptations of oaks, especially the blue and the black oaks. The blue oak in this case is on the left and the black, oh sorry, valley oak, misspoke. Blue oak on the left, valley oak on the right. Um, black oaks coincidentally are not quite as fire hardy, but these two species tend to grow in fairly hot, dry conditions. They grow in the valleys with all the grass. Their bark is really thick and quite fire resistant. Once again, if you've built a fire in your wood stove, you'll know you probably it's not super useful to burn the bark of the oaks. It just does not light very well. Um, when the fires come through, oaks are really fast to re-sprout. This photo is from a Sonoma, the Tubbs fire up in Sonoma County fairly recently, and recently, I mean a couple years ago. Um, and here on the left is actually a little oak sapling it's re-sprouting, even though it was a tiny oak sapling, got burnt to the ground, it's already re-sprouting the first rains. So just quite, you know, oaks are just quite well adapted to them, especially moderate intensity fires. And moving on to grasslands. Um, these habitats are the most altered in California and they're altered for a number of reasons. For one thing, Historically, they were burnt every one to five years, highly managed. Um, that allowed the grasslands to stay at the grassland stage of succession. Otherwise, in the absence of disturbance, brush and shrubs tend to infill, then behind brush and shrubs, forests. So people use fire to keep these spaces open and also to stimulate growth of seed producing, food producing plants. One of the ways our grasslands have been most altered is invasive species. Now, most grasslands are predominantly invasive annual grasses. So that golden brown hills that you see, those are pretty much non-native grasses. Here on the right is a picture of a coastal prairie with a perennial bunch grass which stays alive for you know, up to 100 years or so. Long, long lived species. And here on the left is our non-native oat grass. Both types of grasses burn, non-native grasses burn even faster though. But generally grass is a really fine material. It burns quickly, but the fire passes through and is not very hot. Deep rooted, plants like these perennial bunch grasses can readily re-sprout and recover. And on the right here is a picture of our state grass, purple needle grass. And on the left, the bunch grasses are recovering from a fire. Another type of grassland might be better named a forb land, <laughs> although that's a term I use quote me on that. Um, but some beautiful examples are, here's a picture from Bear Valley. Some of you may have seen pictures of Criso Plain. Um, those actually were not necessarily predominantly grasses. They were predominantly these annual wildflowers that would just create gorgeous displays and then dry and shrivel so it looks fairly desolate if you're there in the off season or the dry season. Um, Forbes resprout and respond really nicely to fire. I speculate that their seeds being able to lie dormant in the soil for a long time are pretty well equipped at coming back after a fire. Um, yeah, so then just thinking about 
if a goal in land management or generally is to try and get our ecosystems back to that most healthy state, there are complicating factors that make that um, just make new challenges compared to what was in the past. Controlled burns are complex, liability, bureaucracy, timing, labor, fire frequency. If it's too short of an interval, especially for shrublands, then you can have a situation where you have habitat conversion. Basically, the shrubs just can't outcompete all the weeds coming in, and also the annual grasses tend to be even more flammable, increase the chance that they'll ignite and the fire will spread, and then it converts to a weedy grassland. 100 plus years of fire suppression is a big change. So in order to reinstate, if we were going to try and allow fire to pass through in areas where it was safe, we'd have to do a lot, we have to do a lot of clearing of ladder fuels to prep it essentially. Climate change, as we all know, um, those extreme fires can actually create a situation where the incinerating hot temperatures sterilize the top layer of soil or even create a dead soil layer, which can be really dangerous for even people, especially if it's on a slope, as it can cause hydrophobic layer and then mudslides and uh, yeah, just causes a whole nother layer of problems. Then just general invasions, people, <laughs> us, not all people, but you know, um, plant pathogens, pests, and then invasive species. <laughs> so what, what's some takeaways from this? Generally in shrublands or a chaparral, especially if it's a slow growing species, you have like manzanita, probably if it's a healthy intact shrubland, just trying to prevent fires from happening too frequently, especially if it's a habitat that's already threatened by encroachment from invasive species as the fire and disturbance, and even actually the effects of chipping and clearing over clearing to mitigate for fire can allow openings into that habitat for invasive species and could make it even more flammable. Um, then in forests, basically aiming for a moderate fire interval, not as frequent as historic, even if it's up in the Sierras and those high elevations, there's been some studies and test examples where they tried burning every 10 years to mimic that. And they found, once again, invasive species played a, a new and important role where they would just come in a little too fast if they had the exact replica of that every 10 year model. So kind of a medium amount. <laughs> Same for oak woodlands. And then our big, biggest um, land management option is probably mechanical fuel reduction, so not logging, but trimming lower branches, you know, clearing some underbrush, creating more of an open um, spaced understory so that when fires do come through or with controlled burns, it stays at more of that surface level intensity. And then in grasslands, continued, in an ideal situation, if you could have regular controlled burns, where it was safe, of course, um, that seems to benefit them the best. A one time, a one of event with a controlled burn may not necessarily favor natives over weeds. And then some images of fire resilient landscapes. So how does this all relate to our home environment or especially when we're living in an urban wild place, urban wildland situation. Um, in this case, this is a picture of Southern California where a home was situated and a fire already came through, the home survived. You can see they did leave a patchwork of trees and the trees are recovering. And then even though there's some clearing of shrubs, you know, up the bank from the house, you can see there's still intact shrubs and just that sort of patchy height difference through the landscape and breaking up the homogeneous continuity of vegetation really decreases the fire's ability to travel and makes it more patchy and not as intense. Here's a picture of actually Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, which had a fire that passed over it. 
and sort of through it. This is one of their little manzanita gardens. And you can see the trees in the background, they're all burnt. But the fire kind of skimmed over the section, probably because it had boulders and rocks and some gravel pathways just breaking up that continuity. Here's another picture from the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. This is a little succulent garden that survived very nicely. And you can barely tell there was a fire there because they have pathways surrounding it. So that's a little break in the landscape. And then of course, succulents just don't burn as much, although they can in incinerating heat. <laughs> and then some inspiring photos. Uh, this is, these are gardens designed by Greg Rubin. He works in San Diego. This is, these are gardens in inland San Diego where it's you know pretty extreme fire conditions and these gardens he's found to be really resilient to fire um, and the main thing to look at here is that people are using a technique which I'll talk about a little bit um, which is in that first five or so feet of space around the house you want to maybe shift when you can away from planting right up against structures to instead having maybe a patio or a pathway and then having your gardens spaced out a bit. And then this also shows how by using pavers or gravel pathways, it kind of breaks up that continuity of vegetation. And then this picture always takes a minute to load, but this is a garden that I designed for my family and put in and it's in oak woodlands. So it's a familiar habitat for me at least. And the main thing to see here is we tried to create pathways, although we do have to rake the leaves sometimes. But then the other thing is when you're planting shrubs right below trees, kind of a general rule of thumb is you want to allow a good amount of space up to maybe three times the height of the shrub if possible, but between that shrub and the lowest limb of the overhanging tree and just having that gap in vegetation helps. And then with creating a fire resistant home, now this is really important more in urban or a wild urban interface, not necessarily applicable to if you live in, you know, Midtown Palo Alto or something, but <laughs> this is an example of having a non-flammable first little five feet space buffer this is actually my house, um, so <laughs> easy to take a photo of. But um, basically what we've tried to do is have fairly low growing. It's all native plants here, but we've had fairly low growing and I water it close to the house here. And then just kind of keeping it clear. And then the other thing that people sometimes kind of pass over or forget is just home hardening is really important. So as much as we want to focus in on our landscape, we should first just pay attention to those home hardening techniques like metal screens that have a fine mesh on them. So any vents in your foundation or under the eaves going into the attic, you really want to have one eighth inch mesh or smaller. That's a big one. And that prevents embers from flying in because that's kind of the main way homes burn is embers incoming. It's not just flames approaching through the brush. It's it's those incoming embers. And then just removing flammable things in the summer, especially. I'm gonna keep going, but all this can be available for you to peruse and we can answer questions afterwards. Here's a map that will also be part of <laughs> materials. And yeah, I'm, I think in the interest of time, we can move on to questions, but I am totally happy to answer stuff and I have just as a last note <laughs> safety tips if you are doing fire clearing in the dry season like now which is fire season you really want to work in the cool hours of the day don't use mechanical equipment when it's dry windy conditions <laughs> and don't use your mower in a rocky dry grass area and just you know general safety keep in mind whatever cal fire precautions are as these are and then resources, more stuff. And a little good news to end on. I just saw this yesterday. This is a fairly local tribe, um, Esalon, and they just acquired a big chunk of property 
which is really exciting. So maybe some, some, a bit of land returning to some traditional land management practices. There we go. All right. Okay. Hello, good evening. Uh, great to see uh, a number of familiar faces out there. Uh, unfortunately, it reminded me of, of some ancient history. I, I started uh, in the trail construction business back in the early 1980s, and uh, I worked on an organization called the Trail Center, and one of my mentors in that organization was Don Whedon that I see out here. And uh, I, I have memories of, I think, in his living room working on, was it an Apple II or something like that, writing a newsletter. He was quite the pioneer in computers in the day. So anyway, good to see you out there, Don. Uh, so uh, as area manager now for Mid-Peninsula Open Space, uh, I uh, coordinate all of the land management tasks in our Skyline region. We'll get a quick look at where that is in a moment. I've been working here at Mid-Pen for 35 years, starting as a ranger, uh, then doing trail building uh, with the machinery for a few years, uh, now supervising and managing uh, maintenance crews. Uh, I'm excited to get this opportunity to share with you uh, what Mid-Pen is already doing uh, with vegetation management in mind on our properties and where we are hopefully headed in the future. So boy, Nikki gave a, a great presentation on what fire is all about. Um, and all of that background folds into uh, the type of work that we're trying to do and trying to actually put into practice on roughly 64,000 acres of land out there. Um, so just as a quick overview, uh, here's where Midpen is located. Uh, okay, there's a couple new properties that aren't on that map yet, but it's close. Uh, we manage 26 preserves in northern Santa Clara County, southern San Mateo County, and just a tiny bit uh, out into Santa Cruz County. Um, so most of the land that we manage is along the crest of the Santa Cruz mountain range. Uh, a couple of pieces out on the, uh, on the bay lands, and now getting closer to the coast with some of the properties we're, we are now responsible for. Uh, we were formed back in 1972. Most people, uh, and I think our public relations department prefers, we get called MidPen now, uh, formed by a grassroots movement uh, back in the day. And now, you know, 48 years later, uh, we're, we're taking care of a pretty enormous amount of property. Uh, it's been fun to watch the Foothills Park uh, discussion as to whether that should be open to the public and not just to the city residents, because the choice to make Foothills uh, just for city residents was sort of the inspiration for Midpen to form uh, back in the 70s. So it's kind of fun to see that coming around again. Um, so the three main parts of our mission are to acquire property in perpetuity, to protect and restore uh, that, those locations to, uh, as natural environment, and then to provide ecologically sensitive opportunities for public enjoyment and education. Uh, out in the coastal area, when we expanded out that way, I think in 2014, we did add to our mission uh, a portion that says that we support agricultural heritage and preserve rural character, uh, which is taking us down the path of having some row crop properties out there, uh, some cattle grazing properties out there uh, that is now a part of the uh, open space mission. Um, so uh, as a district, we run uh, through a budget of something like $40 million a year, mostly funded by property taxes. Uh, in uh, just a few years back, uh, we passed a bond measure, measure AA, that is providing us uh, $300 million uh, to put toward capital projects over the, the well, 30 years from 2014. Um, so you know, we do have a, a chunk of money to put toward property acquisition and uh, development of things like parking lots and trails. Uh, and some portion of that can go toward resource management, but some of that's not quite capital, so it's uh, not, not as much as we were thinking originally. But, uh, but we are overseen by a board of directors that's voted into office uh, and a ton of work performed by volunteers, staff, and contractors out there. So we're here to talk about fire. Uh, and there's a whole lot to cover uh, about what fire does, how to avoid it, what kind of damage it can do. Uh, so I'm going to sort of pick up uh, where Nikki uh, covered and, and keep going on what fire is. Um, we talked about fire and some of the different habitats it's in, some of the different uh, characteristics of fire, the ground fire and the crown fire. Uh, a lot of that is related to what they call the, the fire behavior triangle. 
that fire is driven by topography. Uh, the slope, the steeper the slope is, the faster a fire burns. So a house at the top of a slope is more at risk than a house at the bottom of the slope. Or where you choose to go suppress a fire or put in a fire uh, prevention line or fuel management, you might choose it based on topography. Aspect means south facing slopes burn hotter than, than uh, north facing slopes. Uh, the fuels uh, can be fine fuels like the grasslands or heavy fuels like down timber in a, in a wind blown uh, old growth forest. Um, the arrangement, the amount of fuel, uh, and the amount of moisture in that fuel can all have big effects on how a fire burns. And of course, the weather is the one that we see the most. Uh, high winds being one of the, the major factors in, in how a fire burns, and that affects what's at risk when that fire is burning. You know, people who are in the path of a, a high wind uh, through some topographic channel uh, that, that focuses the wind uh, into some particular draw, they're going to burn a lot hotter uh, than, than somebody that's uh, on the lee side of a hill or somewhere where there's less wind. So uh, all of these factors are, are big considerations in discussing where to do fuel management, where to prescribe burns, and what those mean. So uh, as mentioned before, all fires need an ignition source. Uh, lightning uh, is, the, is the most common natural cause. Uh, uh, but this portion of California that we live in uh, has relatively few of those, but they do happen. I've been uh, you know, a dozen or more of those over, over 30 years, so they're, they're out there. Um, typically in this area, they get extinguished quickly uh, because they're usually pretty easy to find. Uh, as mentioned before, uh, before uh, the uh, colonization, if you will, of this area, uh, Native Americans did an enormous amount of burning. Uh, it's interesting to see uh, and, and kind of think about some of the numbers um, when uh, Native Americans were burning in this area, uh, they, they had a, a very high number of fires. And as soon as their population declined, the, the number of fires declined dramatically. And uh, it was interesting to see a little perspective uh, that says, you know, when uh, pre-1800, potentially something like uh, 1.8 million hectares or 4.4 million acres burned annually in California. We now uh, get uh, very worked up when you know, anything like millions of acres are burning. Uh, and you know, to, to imagine that the experience of the Native American could well have been smoky skies uh, for much of the summer uh, because of either lightning fires that just kept burning or, or because of uh, 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 ignitions that they, they caused, uh, where, where now we're, we're seeing a very different fire regime um, uh, and consider it extreme when compared to you know, a couple of hundred years ago, but it might have been pretty normal. Just interesting to have that perspective. Uh, so we, we know about this fire history in, in a number of ways, but one way is to look at tree rings. Uh, and that by taking a, a look at multiple trees, including down trees, trunks, stumps, things like that, you can start to match the scars uh, across these different trees and put together a pretty long history uh, of the frequency of fire and the intensity of fire uh, in some of these areas. Uh, so this one goes back to 1650. Uh, and by counting those scars, you get an estimate of, of fire frequency. Uh, so locally, there's an interesting study uh, by uh, uh, Scott Stevens and Dan Fry that looked at uh, redwoods in, in uh, Hutter Park, Wonderlick Park, and Jasper Ridge, and came up with a, uh, an average uh, fire occurrence uh, of something, or a fire return interval of between nine and 16 years in the years uh, 1500 to 1880, roughly. Um, lightning fires may have been relatively rare, so we might presume that some significant percentage of this is uh, Native American burning, uh, but uh, you know, it could be that, that there, there were lightning strikes every 10 years that just kept burning. Um, so just trying to get a, a perspective on uh, pre-colonization uh, fire 
Um, so it, in nature, it, it could be that fire return intervals, uh, as sort of mentioned before, in grasslands, oak woodlands could, could have recurred as often as every two years, um, and probably on the high end every eight to 11 years, where chaparral probably would have recurred somewhere in the 30 to 70 year range. Um, so this is what fire would have been uh, without our uh, imposition of, of suppression, our fears. Uh, so interesting to see uh, what changes over time when you suppress fire. Uh, so one of those uh, uh, you can see in a couple of pictures from, from the East Bay, where in the uh, 1900 range, uh, vegetation was very open grassland. Some of that could have been altered by fire, some by grazing. Uh, once we suppress fire and uh, potentially take grazing off the land, things get forested, wooded, brushed over uh, uh, over time periods like 100 years. Uh, you can see some pretty dramatic uh, change in that time period. Uh, so uh, we can see the same things happening on Midpen. I don't have pictures of them, uh, but you can see uh, uh, places like Windy Hill that used to be grassland when it was grazed, now it's all covered with brush. Uh, and without fire, where is it headed? You know, will it become oak woodland uh, or what's it going to become you know, in the next 50 years or 100 years? So fire is, is a significant disturbance uh, in the ecosystems. Um, many ecosystems are adapted to that, they thrive with that, uh, but the exclusion of grazing and fire has led to noticeable change. Um, just to get a look at the fire history, and it's just, uh, again, interesting to see what the peninsula is like compared to other portions of the, the Bay Area. Uh, so if you look at a, a state, you know, larger statewide view, you know, the bright red spots are where there are uh, more recent fires, some pretty large fires. The yellower ones are older fires from, from uh, as far back as, I think, 1878 in the data that CAL FIRE has. But if we look at uh, a close-up view, I hope I hit one more button, there it goes. Um, uh, if you look at a close-up view of the peninsula here, it's interesting to see that we have relatively few, uh, I think their low limit was like 300 acres or something, so you won't see small fires here, but relatively few large fires in the San Mateo portion of the Santa Cruz Mountains. You get a few more when you get down into the area south of Los Gatos, down into the Sierra Azul, uh, Mount Amanum, Loma Prieta range. You know, that chaparral area, hotter, drier, tends to burn more frequently. Um, but the, you know, the large fires in San Mateo County were back in the 60s, and, and uh, uh, we haven't had much since. What does that mean? And you get to ask questions about, does that mean we, we are at risk and could have more fires? Um, or is that because of our fog bank that we don't get a lot of fires? Or wait, our fog bank's changing, are, are we going to see more? Um, so there are lots of things to debate on, on what, what it means for our future, uh, but interesting to see what our past history of fire has been in this area. So to try to recognize that open space uh, can burn, uh, and what the heck are we going to do to to manage open space uh, to best uh, be prepared for the risk of fire headed into communities, or what's the best way to use fire uh, to to manage habitats? Uh, I'll go through first a few things that we do now, and then talk about where we're headed. Uh, we're developing a new EIR that's going to allow us to do quite a bit of, of work out there. So. Uh, uh, in preparation for fire season, we plan for a lot of work. We undertake a lot of environmental assessment, assessments to protect things like sensitive species and habitats. And then we implement as much as we can before fire season. Uh, a lot of things don't, aren't effective until things start to dry out. So things like mowing of dry grass doesn't happen until it's pretty much dry. Uh, there can be some, some green in there. We try to get to it as early as we can. Um, uh, and then a, a, a good amount of the work that we do is best done to avoid things like nesting birds, uh, which often we can't do the work until something like September uh, or do other surveys to avoid uh, disturbance to nesting birds. Um, so there is fire protection work, vegetation manage work, management work that continues throughout the summer and into the fall. 
the picture you see is running a masticator on Page Mill Road where uh, City of Palo Alto and the uh, Santa Clara Fire Safe Council have done a lot of work to create a fuel break on both sides of Page Mill Road for most of its length uh, as a community escape route and a, as a potential place to stop a fire. So that's uh, right up at Shotgun Bend. Uh, a lot of the work that we do is just to keep roads open so that firefighters can get into our properties. So you see this large tree that came down out in Long Ridge or culverts uh, that are failing that make it so roads aren't aren't passable for emergency vehicles. Uh, so access to our preserves for emergency vehicles uh, and some of the routes on our properties also serve as emergency escape routes for communities. Uh, so trying to keep those roads passable and open. Of course, the roads that we buy are historic logging roads or ranch roads that weren't really designed to be long-term sustainable roads all put in, in the, the right place. So uh, some of this is a lot of work or we have to move the road or the trail or uh, significantly alter the drainage in order for it to, to be more sustainable for sedimentation as well as for access. Winter storms, of course, do a, a lot of work uh, to uh, damage what's out there and, and uh, I guess that keeps us working for a long time. So a lot of that work is, is uh, important to be prepared for fire season. Uh, once they're drivable, we do all kinds of vegetation management. So you, you, you imagine 235 miles of roads just to keep the vegetation back to make them drivable is a lot of work. Uh, and then some of them we, we clear more brush uh, that are uh, uh, more uh, uh, roads appropriate for a fuel break or for an emergency escape route. Uh, some specialized equipment like these big mowers and the track, ma track chipper are, uh, are key to being productive. Um, we also uh, disc in certain areas. We, we don't want to do a lot of it, but there are places particularly close to communities, uh, close to roads that are potential ignition sources uh, in grasslands, where if a fire were to start, it would burn quickly uh, and cover a large area or, or be headed toward homes. Um, so we, we put in about 26 miles of disc lines uh, but don't, uh, don't intend to do a lot of those. We've abandoned quite a few of them over the years, so we're doing less than we were. Um, uh, so it, it is an option, but, but not a preferred option. Uh, on a much larger landscape scale, uh, our conservation grazing program does reduce fuel in the grasslands. We don't graze it maybe as much as some of the past grazing that made it bare dirt, and then it was a great barrier for, for fire. Uh, we, we graze it a lot less uh, in many cases, so there is still fuel, it will still burn, uh, but the intensity of the fire uh, will be less through that area. And we're also trying to, to work with cattle grazing to uh, improve our, our native plant populations uh, and then support the agricultural uh, community on the coast by, by having these kind of operations. Uh, in, in order to minimize fires. One of our big roles as a district is to minimize fire ignitions. Uh, so we do have you know, lots of rules uh, to, to prevent uh, people from starting fires out there. Uh, we have rangers that enforce those regulations. We do a lot of communication to talk to visitors, uh, either through our website, uh, getting information out about uh, fire danger, particularly now on, on red flag fire danger days. Uh, uh, as to being much more cautious out there in the open space. So our, our future uh, is changing. We are recognizing that uh, fire is going to play a different role here. Fire is likely to be more intense. We, we already have longer fire seasons. Uh, we look back on, on the last few years and, and they're you know, four to eight weeks longer dry seasons than we had in the past. Uh, the, the fire season therefore is uh, things dry out more uh, and uh, in parts of the state, you know, not quite so much here in the, in the peninsula, but parts of the state have year round fire seasons now where you know, Southern California can burn in January, which traditionally would have been uh, outside of the, the fire season. Uh, so we're, we're developing uh, an environmental impact report uh, 
to be able to do more activities on our land to either manage vegetation, to manage forest health, uh, and eventually to do uh, prescribed fire, to put prescribed fire back uh, on the land. Uh, the objectives are to protect the resources, to enhance the resources, to uh, educate the public and, and be uh, more uh, uh, working together with public safety concerns, uh, to prioritize what we do, because uh, there, there's way more land than we can manage quickly, but there, there are things that we can do sooner rather than later. Um, we're working to, to improve our response to wildfire and to promote uh, activities that, that manage the use of fire on our land. Um, so we, we are developing wildland fire pre-plan maps and resource advisor maps that help us understand what's on our land um, so that we can be prepared uh, by knowing where our roads are, what things we want to protect out there, where endangered species are, we'd rather not bulldoze through uh, ponds that are red-legged frog or, or San Francisco garter snake habitat that we'd rather not pump all the water out of, uh, to, to be prepared by knowing what's out there when the fires do occur. Uh, and then in order to be more proactive, we're going to be doing more uh, monitoring of wildland fuels. There were questions in the chat about uh, developing better uh, vegetation mapping. So we've been part of a program that's doing uh, first aerial photography and translating those aerial photographs into vegetation maps uh, and then uh, uh, using LIDAR data and then ground truthing it all and trying to come up with some much better uh, understanding of what vegetation's out there and particularly as it relates to the risk of, of fire uh, and, uh, and it can tell you a lot about the, the evolution of a habitat or an ecosystem that has had fire uh, taken out of it for a long period of time. So. You know, lots of things to, to learn from that. Uh, prescribed fire is going to be a little bit slower coming, but it is something we intend to work on uh, district-wide. Uh, traditionally, we did some grassland burns, but we would like to branch out into understory burns in the forests and, and uh, chaparral burns are probably a, a ways down the road, but uh, it is potential that we can start looking at some of that. Uh, and then uh, all of the management of vegetation that we do is trying to have in mind that as the climate changes, how do we set up open space to be flexible, to allow plants to move, to have a variety of habitats, a, a variety of conditions where the one that's most successful as things change uh, will, will be still there and, and able to uh, move around or whatever habitats do over time as the climate changes. So uh, we worked on maps. So I'll just jump a little bit just to show you what some of these maps are starting to look at, look like. Um, so this is Rancho San Antonio. Uh, shaded areas are identifying creeks or, or other habitats that we'd like to avoid putting bulldozers in or things like that. It shows roads, it shows water sources, uh, quite a variety of types of things that, that we would like to know when it's time for a fire, uh, including what types of uh, fire engines can get out there because there's a lot of different fire engines and knowing where they can go is very helpful uh, when there is a fire out there. Uh, we want to keep an eye on what changes are going on out there as we modify the fuel mechanically or through prescribed fire or uh, any other method that gets applied out there. Uh, we want to know whether what we're doing is working. Uh, so we're going to keep an eye on projects, uh, keep an eye on the weather, keep an eye on the, the fire cameras that help show what what fire what happens during fires. Be prepared to respond after a fire uh, to monitor uh, what changes and what we should do different uh, uh, to be better prepared before the next fire. Uh, the vegetation management plan is going to allow us to do. Uh, work out in the ecosystems. Part of it is directly for fire safety, you know, to, to recognize where escape routes are, are, where communities are, and to do fuel management around those locations for community fire safety. The other part is a much larger scale, and although it does have some fuel altering benefits, it's more oriented to uh, the discussion that Nikki had about some of the, the forests that are logged, 
that have a lot of small trees that aren't really uh, the, the natural forest per se. They've been so altered uh, to allow us to go into those kind of places and thin them out, do some prescribed burn, encourage the large trees, help them along toward uh, sort of that late uh, cereal stage forest uh, to help them get there more quickly. Uh, and that could be happening on potentially hundreds or thousands of acres uh, 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 over, the, over the years. So to, uh, uh, didn't know what happened there. Uh, so to look at vegetation management primarily for fire safety, we try to look at a lot of factors. You know, what vulnerable populations are near us, like retirement homes, like schools, like fire stations, like uh, uh, certain types of communities. Um, where are evacuation routes? Uh, what are uh, critical infrastructure like these radio towers? If those get burned over and the fire departments can't communicate, that's a big deal, so we want to protect those. So trying to go through a long list of things we want to protect, um, take all of that, put it into a GIS database, doesn't run on the Apple II, Don, it takes a lot more computing power than that, um, cover the whole district, and, and prioritize you know, all of the overlaps of, of all of these different issues uh, helps us to create some maps. Uh, we do weigh in the, the hazard zones that the CAL FIRE has uh, created uh, over the years. Uh, so that is a factor. Uh, and eventually we come out with a map that looks something like this, uh, showing cross-hatched areas where we could do forest management, highlighted yellow areas where we could do fuel breaks. Those might be routes, those might be main highways, Alpine Road, Skyline Boulevard, some of these kind of places uh, where we either already do or would be willing to work with uh, vegetation management to improve those zones. Um, we have one of those now for every preserve uh, to give us an idea of what's out there. Uh, and there's a lot of things to digest you know, as you look at the details of those. So what some of those might look like, uh, you know, fuel breaks can be things like the disc lines that are bare earth. Hopefully that's really unusual. Hopefully most of them are looking more like this. You take a, a dense forest, uh, you alter it by reducing the density of the canopy, reducing the, the ground cover, uh, uh, but it still is a, a patchy appearance. It still has a variety uh, of species, of ages, uh, uh, and the, the flammability of that condition should be still flammable, still burn, just not as fast or as intense as it might have uh, prior to that management. So there's, there's different ways to look at that, uh, different ways to, uh, to visualize it, uh, what you do on slopes, how it looks when it's next to a road so that uh, you could potentially put the fire out at the road if the fire is a low enough intensity that you can put a firefighter there. Um, and so that's the, the intent in, in a number of these places. When we start to talk about ecosystem resiliency, doing more landscape scale management, uh, then we start looking at things like sensitive resources that might do well if we did a little bit of uh, thinning out there. Uh, places where, uh, as was talked about before, uh, dead trees, the sudden oak death, there are certain parts of our properties that are seeing a lot of that. Um, uh, where, where would we go in and do large scale uh, hazard tree reduction uh, and trying to prioritize those? Um, so a lot of that uh, has to again be digested and prioritized and think about areas that might work well. Um, you know, places that are changing dramatically because of the exclusion of fire might be good places to go in and do some work to uh, maintain those habitats instead of uh, losing what was once there. Um, I did put in one little picture of our prescribed burn we did over 10 years ago out in Russian Ridge. We, we did historically do some grassland burning. Uh, we, had, we were doing that under an EIR that didn't correctly apply to this area. It was designed for Chaparral burns in Southern California and Cal Fire was using it statewide uh, when it was pointed out that uh, there were issues that uh, there were some benefits to burning. There are also some species that did not do well from burning and there may be other alternatives 
uh, to manage that we will be looking at as part of the EIR to make some of these decisions. Uh, so you know, the general idea is to, on a, on a large scale, uh, uh, change the conditions from the small trees and brush, relatively few large trees uh, uh, that have higher, higher fire intensity uh, and also alter the water supply, they alter the carbon sequestration process, you know, lots of changes by uh, what logged and, and uh, uh, for, what forests uh, represent when they're not uh, being burned periodically or, or managed in a natural way. Um, so the objective is to reduce the number of trees per acre, uh, more large trees, more older trees, where fires can burn less intensively, uh, more resiliency due to the variety of habitats uh, and uh, the benefits hopefully for the water supply and uh, climate change uh, mitigation, carbon sequestration. Then to see that what we're doing is working, you, you've got to keep an eye on things. Uh, what happens during, during a fire? What happens during land management object, uh, uh, implementation? Uh, to see whether it's, whether it's working, achieving the uh, expectations of what the habitat should become or uh, what plants and animals are doing well there. You need to keep an eye on it and then make changes. There's a lot of research on fire and how you apply that locally may or may not be accurate to what exactly you're going to see in your conditions, in your habitats, terrain, temperatures, climate, or all the various factors that go into it. Uh, so keeping an eye on it and uh, moving on from there. So uh, the general process that we are in the midst of right now, I think this one's slightly old, we're preparing the draft EIR right now. Uh, we'll be working for uh, maybe the next year or so on an environmental impact report uh, that will allow us to do significantly more than what we're allowed to do under the, the current environmental impact report. Um, We'll get a lot of input from the public, from the fire agencies, from resource managers uh, on what that should look like. There are consultants that are working hard on it. Uh, so it's a great opportunity to get involved and the EIR has to address all kinds of things. And when you start talking about you know, significant vegetation alteration or, uh, or prescribed fire, uh, the impacts on the aesthetic, the air quality, the biological resources, the noise, uh, the transportation, the water, those are a lot of things to evaluate uh, on a pretty large scale when we're talking about district-wide. Um, so we, we've got a lot to digest uh, to put this thing together. Um, as I say, I think some of these dates are a little bit out of date now, uh, but the, the, so I think the final EIR is now a little bit delayed until uh, uh, mid-2021, but uh, uh, we do have a website uh, openspace.org is shown at the bottom of the screen there. There's a page all about the wildland fire resiliency uh, and great opportunity to see the draft EIR and the documents as they come up, provide us comments, uh, let us know what you think uh, of how this might work uh, on, on all of the open space that I know you all enjoy. So uh, I think that wraps up what I uh, had in mind. Uh, I have plenty of time for questions. See if I can dig my way back to the chat, uh, or if somebody else wants to share any questions that have come up from there. Thank you, Craig. That was great. Um, you do have one question from Marianne about whether there's a specific vegetation management plan for Windy Hill, and is there a timeline for starting work there? Yeah. So, so Windy Hill. Uh, I, I sorry. I should have maybe should have picked that map. Um, we do have a map. There's a, 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 such a wide variety of this choice between what we're going to do now, you know, what's the most urgent, uh, and then what is possible to do when we have the opportunity. So uh, I know the, the area behind the sequoias has been a high priority in Windy Hill, uh, potentially some work along Alpine Road as an escape route for the Coal Mine Ridge community is, is potentially a priority. Things like the uh, brush that's coming in in, in the, the mid-slope portions of Windy Hill didn't float up at this point as a priority. It's on the list of something that we could do as part of the ecosystem resiliency. Uh, 
um, where we could uh, start to manage that. But a as a priority for a threat to a communities, uh, didn't come up in the data that we analyzed at this point, but now's the time to provide that input uh, to, to help us uh, refocus priorities if that's uh, what's, uh, what's important. And I, I, I'll have to double check, but I'm pretty sure the maps and our, our prioritization at this point is, is available on our website. All right, great. Well, and I see you have kudos from your coworker, Renee, who's with us, uh, who runs the docent program for MidPen. And I know all of us feel the same that that was really a, a wealth of information, as was Nikki's presentation.